are you? Welcome everyone to our Fridays for Future Earth Day panel discussion. I'm Aidan Randall and I'm a Fridays for Future activist from Owen Sound. And today we're gonna to be talking about how we can learn from the coronavirus pandemic and take action on climate change in our communities. We're gonna talk about many of the issues that are facing us, including climate catastrophe, global warming, and, and local issues such as composting and waste management. I was raised in Halifax and I was raised in West Gray. And now I live in the great city of Owen Sound, but it could be even greater if you we were taking action on climate change. I'm thrilled to be part of this event. I started this event. And I was raised by parents who are environmentalists, vegan from birth. And I always was taught to respect the nature and the environment. When I found out about the Fridays for Future strikes at City Hall, I started joining those and then I started participating in delegations to the City Council and the Operations Committee. And then I decided to plan this event because I believe we should stay connected during this difficult time. We need to stay united and talk about these issues. The our evening for tonight is going to start with our great panelists, John Tamming and Liz Zetlin. And they're going to each talk about 10 minutes each. And then we're going to start asking them questions for 20, about 20 minutes. Then we'll open it up to questions to, from the audience. And if you're watching this right now and you want to ask a question, you can use the chat at the bottom of the screen and type your question in there. And we'll try to get to those. If you're watching on an iPad or a tablet or a phone, it's best to click the more icon at the bottom right corner and then you'll be able to click chat. I think the coronavirus pandemic has shown that we can take action and our government can respond to a crisis with the urgency that it requires. We've seen them shut down the airlines and non-essential industry, things that we would need to do to solve the climate crisis. We have to do these things and, and more to avert climate catastrophe. The climate crisis is even more devastating than the coronavirus if we do not act in the way that we should. We need to do large steps, much more than we're seeing today, because some things that people don't know are like 7 million people die every year because of air pollution. And if the global temperature continues to rise, we'll see more and more spreading of disease, more pandemics. So we must start treating it as a crisis and create an economy that represents the needs of our planet, not just corporations and greed. I'm so pleased to be joined today by Lydia Dick, who's from West Gray. I'm also from West Bay and we've known of each other for a while. I'm so glad she was able to join us tonight. Lydia, would you like to introduce yourself and say a few words about what you'd like to accomplish? Absolutely, thank you, Aiden. I would like to extend a big welcome to everybody watching as well. It's unfortunate we can't be together face to face tonight, but that certainly yeah. doesn't mean we can't celebrate the Earth on Earth Day, especially on the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Um, so it's great to see lots of you joining us from all over West Gray. And we'd like to encourage you actually to put on the chat where you're from so that we can know who our audience is tonight. If you feel comfortable, you can put your name and your email as well. And we're going to send some great resources um, after the webinar tonight. So I'd like to introduce myself briefly before we introduce our panelists for the evening. My name is Lydia Dick and I'm a resident of Durham as Aidan said. I'm also a soon to be graduate with a BA in Sustainability Studies and Biology from Goshen College in Indiana. Over the past four years, I really come to value the need for multiple perspectives when we're solving complex problems. I think that we can all agree that this current crisis of the pandemic and the looming crisis, um, the economic, ecological crisis are both very complex problems. So I am delighted to be on a panel tonight of people of different ages and expertise 
and that includes our panelists, but also all of you watchers. Though the four of us are going to be starting the conversation tonight, I hope that you, will, you all will continue this conversation long after. So a lot of sustainability work means looking for the most complete picture of what's going on in a certain situation. And with our theme of climate change in the context of COVID-19, it's important that we look at all the different sides to the issue. An example of seeing two sides would be to do with carbon emissions. Even though we have seen immediate results um, with, res with rivers and air clearing, <coughs> climate scientists are saying that these decreases won't really be noticeable in the long term. In other words, whatever low carbon practices we're developing now, we really need to continue to, to post COVID times. And this, I know this sounds daunting, but hasn't it been lovely to drive less? Another parallel I notice is that even as grocery stores are working really, really hard to keep shelves stocked, people are really wanting more food security in this time. And so they're looking to local farmers. I find this really, really exciting this movement towards localism. And it also means I get to keep my internship for the summer. So I'm happy with that. For our conversation moving forward, I'd like to propose that we use this time of the pandemic as a take home exam. Before or maybe after you laugh, think with me on this a little bit. We are home and we can clearly see what's happening in the world around us. And we can only anticipate that it's a fraction of the crisis that will be coming, the climate crisis. As a response to all of this messiness, we each have the responsibility of a take home exam. What parts of our life ways or even our food or economic systems should change during this and after this pandemic time? Are we learning how to cook a new dish with some local food? Are we taking on some other sustainability challenges and teaching ourselves how to slow down? We're gonna talk about these ideas in the question and answer period, which we will get to in around 20 minutes, like Aidan said, after we hear from our panelists. And again, I'm reminding you to put all of your questions into that chat box at the bottom of your screen, and we will get to them and monitor those and hopefully answer them um, during our question and answer period. So Aidan, without further ado, would you introduce our panelists? Yes, thank you, Lydia. And I just wanted to add that before the end of the night, at the, after a discussion, we're going to be hearing from Owen Sound's poet laureate, Richard Eves Satoski. He has a surprise for us tonight. And I think it's a poem that's never been heard before. And I think we should all look forward to that as well. So again, you can ask your questions a little bit later on. But first, you're going to hear from our panelists, Liz Zetlin and John Tamming. So first, let's introduce. Liz Zetlin, she, she's a, a community activist. And let's welcome Liz Zetlin, welcome. Hi, Liz. Hey there. Our other panelist for tonight is John Tamming. Welcome, John. I, hello, John. Oh, oh unmute yourself. John, there you go. Hello. <laughs> it's good to see you, Aiden. Can you hear me? Oh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Great. So now our first speaker for tonight, we're so glad to have an incredible team of panelists with us. Our first speaker is Liz Zetlin, community activist Liz Zetlin. And Liz is the co-producer and director of the Resilience Film, Transforming Our Community. She's the founder of the Owen Sound Water Watchers, a leader of the Great Bruce Climate Action Team. She's the first poet lawyer of the city of Owen Sound. And she also has three grandchildren who she loves very much. She also has been very supportive of young people getting involved in the process. And I started doing delegations to city council. And after that, she gave me a couple of invites to speak at other events, which was really supportive. And I really appreciated how she was supportive of youth speaking up about climate and sustainability. I would like to give a warm welcome to Liz Zetlin. Please welcome Liz Zetlin about how we can take action in our communities. 
Thank you, Liz. <laughs> Thanks so much, Aiden. Um, it's, it's been so inspiring working with you and Lydia. I, I'm actually learning so much and not just tech stuff of, of the probably five rehearsals that we've had. <laughs> So you're, you're so well prepared. And I'm also looking forward to sharing the uh, Zoom stage with John. This is gonna be interesting. So um, hello everybody out there. I, I hope you and your loved ones are safe in these difficult times. Um, it feels like we're on this never ending roller coaster ride right now. Um, so tonight, um, I'm just going to give you a heads up of what I'm going to talk about. First, uh, what can we learn for the pandemic and, uh, and how can we apply that to climate action? And I'm going to show you a few slides of what we can do now locally. There's lots more which you'll get sent to you later if you put your email in the uh, chat. And I'm going to end with a challenge. So here goes. So who knew? Four years ago, when John Anderson and I first started making the Resilience film, that we'd be facing another global crisis right now. And one that affects everyone, one that has caused us to fundamentally change how we work and live and love and connect. And I don't know about you, but I'm having more dreams. Um, and I'd like to share one with you. I was walking in the park at night, I think it was Harrison Park, and this great horned owl cradled in a woman's arms stared at me with huge yellow eyes. And so I reached right for my iPhone so I could photograph it. And, but before I could get to it, it flew away and all I saw was its magnificent wings flapping away. And I woke up full of grief but I wasn't sure why. So I Googled owls and found out that they were the ancient symbol for Athena, the Greek goddess of wisdom. And here's Athena right here. <laughs> She's my garden owl. Um, but Athena is not just the goddess of wisdom, but also courage, inspiration, civilization, justice, the arts, crafts, and skill. So no wonder I was sad because we've been watching as science has caused, has, is being dismissed. Justice is not being fairly applied and courage to do what's required to save lives is just not sufficient. So the pandemic has caused us to find our owl, to harness our creativity really quickly to be inventive and to use all of those skills of the goddess of wisdom. And we're learning that we have to be alert in so many new ways. I mean, every time I touch something, I think twice about it, you know, um, to figure out what risks we should be taking, if any. And so the good news really, that at least I've been learning is that we are exceptional at adapting. We can do this. Owls also signify a time of transition. And so we now have a chance to think about how COVID relates to climate change. Because like, like COVID, climate change involves the entire world and it's being called a crisis, both of them by scientists, econ economists and medical professionals. And it can only successfully be addressed if we act in advance and in solidarity. So like COVID, climate change tells us we're, there, we're in the midst of a crisis of unprecedented magnitude. And we can't ignore the truth anymore that we're all connected and everything each one of us does matters. And yeah, COVID is a tragedy, but it, I think it's also our owl. It's reminding us that we have the wisdom, we have the creativity, we have the power, strength, and resilience. And it also reminds us of the importance of the arts, social justice, and the very survival of our civilization. And we've also learned, I think everybody, that 
What's really important is the health of our family, our friends, community, and the planet. So Earth Day's theme is climate action. And some predict that that's going to take 50% um, of climate action has to be done top down. So that's government legislators and corporations, but the other 50%, give or take, has to happen from the bottom up. And that's grassroots movements, and that's us working together. And in Grey Bruce, we're really fortunate that there are many active environmental groups in our community and that are working to partner with municipalities and other social agencies. But we really need to join them to increase their capacity. They need more members to share the load. Many of us are at the burnout stage and, you know, I, I could vouch for that. <laughs> um, so I've put together a few slides just to show you a few things locally that are happening now that uh, you could participate in. And then um, I'm going to send that out. Aiden's going to send it out to everybody if you put your email in the chat. And um, if you just bear with me while I bring this up. Okay, so we all know that food security is a huge issue right now. So one thing that we can start doing um, if you haven't already, is grow your own food. And this is just one example of Grange Hollow. And they have figured out how to put everything uh, you can order online. Um, there are many other nurseries, I'm sure they're gonna be picking up the same method. And it is just so important for us to grow our own food and to go local. I've been going to Grange Hollow for years and um, they have a fabulous farm and greenhouses. It's, it's really worth the trip. And many of you may be familiar with Eat Local. Um, I had a delivery from them today. They have the most fabulous food from local farmers, but they're at capacity. They, I think they've at least doubled their members in the last week or two. So they've sent out this call for volunteers and you know, if you have one of these skills that they've listed here, get in touch. Uh, you'll get that link later. It's just so important to support our farmers. And tomorrow, um, the important thing, there's gonna be a vision, visioning session. Um, Kat Gray Bruce is hosting this on Zoom. And I think uh, Lydia is gonna be putting links in there um, in the chat for that so you can sign up. Um, Colleen Purden is going to be leading the visioning session um, because what do we do in the time of COVID is a role changed. Um, where do we want to be a year from now? What kind of things do you want to see happen? So uh, I hope you can join us on that. And this uh, has just launched today, 52 weeks of climate action challenge. And I got my first um, challenge today in my inbox and some really interesting stuff. Um, so you can sign up, the link is there and, and uh, you'll get that as well. Um, all sorts of, of uh, really good tips for what we can all do. And we've been working at CAT for a long time to try to connect all the different groups that are around the region. And so um, Gray Bruce Sustainability Network has partnered with CAT to create this website, which is gonna be re ready any day now. Um, and you can find events, there'll be a calendar. You'll be able to find all of those groups so you can volunteer your skills. And there's a really cool kind of online um, chat a collaboration thing where you can talk to people that are working on similar projects. I get a whole bunch of emails every day or from them. So um, there's just a lot going on, a lot of ways to stay connected. 
And finally, um, we hope if you're not already connected with the Climate Action Team, get in touch with us, email us, sign up for a newsletter, which is going into the chat, I think, this sign up thing, if you have it. Um, join our Facebook group and come to some of our monthly meetings, first one tomorrow on Zoom. So I'm going to get out of this now. Okay. <laughs> Hope that worked for you. I hope that gave you some ideas of things that you can do. Um, and check your email tomorrow if you signed in. You should be getting about 20 more ideas. So I'd like to end with an excerpt from the article, What If the Virus is the Medicine? And the authors, Jonathan Edwards and Julia Hartzell, this is what they wrote. This is an opportunity to loosen our grip on old and familiar ways. Those ways worked for us as long as they did and they got us here for better or for worse. They seem unlikely to carry us much further. What if we're instead being asked to feel our way forward from the heart without benefit of certainty, which when concentrated quickly becomes toxic. No one has all the answers in this or any other time. Right now, the questions may be more valuable. So really looking forward to your questions. That's the end of their quote. So just in closing, let's listen to our guardian owl. And um, the owl, Athena here is standing in for um, fauna, you know, of the natural world. And I've got some for Scythia over on the other side for all of the flora. And that's what we wanna take care of all together. So, and, and one more thing, <laughs> the world is changed by our examples, not by our opinions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liz, for your your kind, your incredible uh, ways that we can take action. I think we should all think about those. And when we, we're also going to be including the link to Liz's presentation with the uh, more information about what you can do. Now, we're, uh, Lydia is going to introduce John Tamming. Lydia, go ahead. Thank you, Aiden. I'm looking forward to hearing from John. He. Um... I would like to introduce our second panelist, and he is a litigation lawyer and a first time Owen Sound City Councilor. John is a chair of the Tom Thompson Advisory Committee and a member of the Operations Committee as well. John is a founding member of Front Porch Republic publication. He is a fan of Wendell Berry and all things local. John, we look forward to what you have to say. Thank you. Take it away. Hi, great to be here. Let me say at the outset, produced in Gray County is, uh, and Bruce is quite something. I also am thrilled to be here with Liz. I've known Liz, I think for 20 years. I've read her poetry for as long. And uh, if you have not read her poetry about the limestone of Gray Bruce and about the flowers and about um, everything uh, green and rich about this area, go out and buy some of her poetry. I thought before I get into what municipalities can do, and that's what I've been asked to speak to briefly, I thought I'd just give you a bit of background, uh, what motivates me on this issue. And I should say, as I'm saying this, I'm looking out at Georgian Bay and I'm feeling a uh, deep pride in this area. And when you see something as beautiful as Georgian Bay, you just want to keep it forever. And I hope that uh, that impulse animates many of us. Wally Brooker said it best years ago. He said, the earth is a wounded animal and we keep poking it with sticks. He was right. And Liz is right too. Half of what needs to be done will come from the top. It will come from lobbyists in New York, the United Nations, Ottawa. But half has to come from the bottom up and from the grassroots. And I think Liz is very right to say that. 
But let me say this right off the bat, and I don't mean to be controversial, I can be sometime. I really don't think you can love the earth. On one level, I really don't think you can love this world. You can only, as, as I've lived my life at least and come to understand things, you can only truly love that which is local. I read the, uh, about 10 years ago, I read the works of Wendell Berry for the first time and I was hooked. And with some friends, we founded the Front Porch Republic. And every few years we meet in Western Kentucky in Louisville and we take Wendell Berry out to dinner and we have a little conference and we talk ideas. And I was reminded, just reading his beautiful essay called The Marginal Farm, I was, I was reminded that in 1965, Wendell Berry, after studying abroad, came home. And he walked the Kentucky River. And uh, he was on a little bluff overlooking 14 acres. And he looked down. And all he said to himself was, this is all I need. It's being content with that which is local, with that which lies in front of us. It's having for the villages of Bruce County and for the streets of Owen Sound, for the acreage that you live in in Old Derby, for the acreage you live on in Old Keppel or near Chepstow. You can only love that which is local and have that affection for which is that which is uh, intimately known to you. And so I think of the Rocky Sagin, where Liz herself lived for many years. And I think, uh, for instance, of a herd of cattle just outside Chesley. And I think of a trail that I know near Port Elgin. I think of all these things and I think those are the things you can have affection for. And whatever conservationist impulse comes from us, I hope can be grounded in our love for that which we know best. I could talk about that all day. It's what you see from your front porch that should animate lobbyists, activists, environmentalists, and, and I suppose municipal politicians as well. So with that as background, I just want to talk briefly, and I hope I get, I get to talk more in the question and answer about municipal actions that can be done. I think it's important, first of all, to, to acknowledge some big things have been done in Grey Bruce when it comes to the environment. And some of this may touch on uh, global warming, some of it may not. But I wanna just talk first of all about just three examples. And two of them may be very tiny. For instance, the YMCA that Owen Sound recently built, it leaches off the heat from the ice pads and that helps to heat the pool. It's a very thought out center, the Julie MacArthur Center, for those of you who have been there. The solar panels we've installed in many city roofs, it's not everywhere, it's not everything, but it's something. And that too, developing alternative energy and being a, a role model as municipal politicians, I think that can help us. But the third thing and the most important thing we've done so far is wastewater and water improvements. And I can tell you from personal experience, we have heard it loud and clear pain that has been the wallets of people in, Great, in, in, in Owen Sound because of what we've basically built on the East Harbor. It's a massive um, improvement over what we did have. It removes uh, all of the ammonia and so forth. It was mandated by the federal government, but it was also the right thing to do. But it did come with a price, and perhaps we can talk about the cost of uh, environmental projects later and uh, our appetite as citizens to, uh, to withstand those costs. Because after all, municipal politicians, like any other politician, are sensitive to the fact that things cost money and we need to set priorities. So those are just a few things what we've done. I just wanna highlight what we can do in the future. And it seems to me whenever you read about municipalities and what they can do, uh, you're centered around uh, consumer actions, transportation and buildings. So let me take that in reverse order. With buildings, it seems to me, and I've been convinced by this by several engineers have been very helpful and Liz, Liz is good friends with some of them. You need to start with a base audit of all the buildings that the city owns, which I believe is about 70. I just know Owen Sound Best and I'm sure there's many, many other buildings out there owned by other municipalities, uh, which, uh, which also could use some improvement. Start with an audit, find out what CO2 emissions these buildings are kicking out get a base level in mind and that at least gives you a place to work from as you consider retrofits and so forth. 
I know Lydia herself, uh, it turned out, I just got to chat with Lydia a bit yesterday, and she herself, as a student in Goshen, was involved in, uh, which is a small town in uh, Indiana, got to uh, help on CO2 training there, or CO2, CO2 audits, rather, for buildings in that municipality, and it really, really went well for her. So retrofit your buildings and get an audit of what you've got. Second, transportation. I think, again, you start with a baseline audit of your fleet as a city. Owen Sound, for instance, owns a lot of trucks. So does the county. And so do many of the local municipalities. We have fleets all over Great Bruce that are owned by the public. And would it be neat if you established a baseline amount again of what COTs, what carbon emissions, these things are kicking out, these fleets, and then work towards understanding how you, as you purchase new vehicles, can roll over the fleet and turn it into a green energy. Why not do a few radical things and get us uh, used to discovering these things at the end of our legs called feet and perhaps have our children do the same thing? It, it, it occurs to me, you know, you might even want to, as a city or as a town, close one street off, try it for a year. I'm just blue skying this, as they say, and have bicycles, pedestrians, but no cars on 2nd Avenue West and Oregon Sound. You can pick your street in Hanover. See how it goes, see how people respond. And it might not be the end of the earth. It might work. Have a walk to school day for the kids. Uh, we have these yellow things spewing out emissions constantly. Wouldn't it be neat to see more children like they do in Europe actually get to school on their own feet or by biking their own car, biking their own bike? The third thing we can do, it seems to me, is more consumer action oriented. Uh, Liz talked about that briefly. Uh, ban single use plastics. I know that's been a live issue before uh, our council in Owen Sound, and I hope uh, that gets reintroduced soon. Uh, it's becoming a movement across Canada and indeed the world, and it seems to me we can latch on to that. The second is green bin po uh, composting. That's a very expensive thing for a city to do or for any place to do. I believe last time I looked at it, it was about 300,000 for Owen Sound to do green bin composting. But I've met many people who moved to the area from say the GTA and they're very surprised we don't have it here. Um, look into that, but again, it will come with a price. I just wanna close with a few other uh, comments. Um, and I hope this again, this comes up during the question and answer period. The city suffered a bit of a setback in the eyes of many when it looked we were gung-ho for a climate change specialist. We had proposed to hire one and so forth. And then the next meeting, we sort of backed away from that or some councillors reversed their votes. I think there has to be sensitivity out there to exactly what such a specialist would do. And it has to be thought through and programmed. I personally thought we should have gone through with it. We were outvoted, that's politics. But one thing such a specialist could do, in addition to the, um, to the mitigation aspects, in other words, keeping the CO2 emissions lower, reducing them, in addition, we could think about the mitigation that we're gonna have to do in this area because there's gonna have to be a ton of adaptation. I invite any of you to go to Kelso Beach, which is our, one of our lovely parks here at Owen Sound. Uh, I think the bandstand is threatened and it may be threatened through to summer folk. I don't mean to be alarmist, but we have high water issues uh, all over that park, just as a, for example. What's it gonna cost to mitigate the effects of climate change as it starts to hit our area? Interesting questions. And again, I personally thought we could deal with a climate change specialist on that. Perhaps other people have other ideas. Uh, I look forward to chatting with everybody uh, as the evening progresses. And uh, it's just really, really good to be part of this. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, John, for your perspective. I really liked how you laid a baseline for um, some concrete actions, such as plas banning plastic bags and composting that we can um, see if we can use what other municipalities have done in the past. But I also like that you pointed out some life away kind of changes that we can do, like walking to school or, um, yeah, closing some streets. I'd love to see that in some cities. That'd be fantastic. I'm gonna start by asking a question um, to do with something else I appreciated from both of your, um, what you said. I noticed that a lot of what you talked about was valuing local, our local places, valuing where we live and that this pandemic is really bringing that to light. So my first question 
um, is how does this crisis, this pandemic crisis, enable the city or our community or municipality, whatever scale that you're gonna be talking on, how does it help us to look ahead and readapt systems? And so this can be localized waste systems, like you talked about a little bit, um, food systems, knowledge systems, energy systems. Those are just some examples. I wonder, I would like to hear both of you address this question. So Liz, would you like to start us off? Right. Um, that's a really good point. Um, I, th I just think there's, um, there's just so much that we can do locally. Um, my brain's a little foggy right now. <laughs> so, um, but um, I think one of the things, um, and this I guess is, is back to John, that I think there, you know, there's hundreds of lists of things that we can do. And, and I really would direct you to like our, our Resilience Film website and, um, they're just everywhere. I, I just think that um, in terms of the community and how we work together, um, there's just a lot that can be done that's not happening in terms of good communication and education and public awareness. I, I, I think the fact, um, John, that you mentioned the climate change specialists being, there was so much pushback on that. Um, that uh, council was maybe a little nervous going forward. And my real concern here is that we're listening to opinions rather than science. And, and we have to act on the science. And I know there's huge costs involved, but the longer we wait, the longer, uh, the more it's gonna cost. So that anything that we commit to adapting and mitigation is going to be an investment for the future. So that's really kind of my focus now is systemic change. We can all do things um, individually. And I know that so many people probably here listening tonight are already doing so many of those things, but we've got to wrap it up to the next level. And that's where the municipality comes in. John, feel free to respond to Liz or also take your own slant at this question. What yeah, you it's, it's, it certainly is, is a big question, Lydia. Um, mm -hmm. On COVID, you know, in a way, I agree with Liz. It, it exposes the interconnectedness of this earth. We're all in it together and so forth. I'm concerned though that about two things that COVID has done negatively for the movement in terms of climate change. One, it's not climate change off the front page. It just has. Uh, Greta was all the news just a few months ago and uh, none of that's making the page anymore or the papers anymore. The second thing I'm concerned about, and I mentioned this to some people in all in sound, when people find their wealth reduced by 25, 30%, even if you're retired, uh, you can experience that hit with your portfolio. Or if you've been running a restaurant and it's closed, and I've heard some very sad things lately about potential restaurant closures in our area. It doesn't look good. I'm afraid that people will clamp down psychologically and they will be less open to creative ways of addressing some other concerns such as uh, climate change, which seems uh, to many to be somewhat of a distant problem still, even though it has very real impacts locally. So I'd be curious, uh, Lydia, I don't mean to bounce uh, through you, but I guess I'm curious to ask Liz, Liz, when people are hurting so much financially, how do we convince them that paying a few extra taxes for composting, uh, just as an example for green bins, how do we convince them in a shrunken economy that, that these are still live and vigorous and, and issues worthy of vigorous debate? One thing you could do is hire that climate change specialist and um, develop a communication strategy, strategy and a public education forums. Um, you're right. Um, people are being hit really hard, but I think it's the city's responsibility to take leadership. People look at Owen Sound as a leader in our region. And so far, you've just been sitting there waiting. And you know, I totally, you know, respect you, but um, 
it's it's time to move forward. And you've been a good advocate for this, but um, you know the rest of the council has to come on board. Um, you need to take that uh, leadership role. Understood. Lydia, were there other aspects of your question? Because it was a really thick question. Um, were there other aspects you wanted us to hit or, or did you want to move on? You know what, I think we'll be, we'll be hitting at some of these in some later questions. Um, I think that you both have hit on a very deep kind of part, of part of our conversation because it's both the climate crisis and the pandemic crisis is affecting our economy. It's affecting how we're feeling because people are getting stressed about COVID obviously, but also about climate change. People are getting anxious. Um, and it's affecting our social, how we, how we work together and collaborate. So all of these different pieces need to come together. And yes, that's very hard, but I wonder if Aiden could take us on to our next question now. And we'll probably address some of these things later. And I will take it. Nope. Unmute yourself there. <laughs> all right. Yeah, I was just, Muted for a moment, but that's all right. I'll, I'll be asking the second question. I'd like to ask Liz and John again. But first, I'd like to ask John. Remember a few months ago, I went to a delegation and spoke to the council. And after that, the city voted and was going to hire a climate change specialist, which you already talked about tonight. But my question was like, a few weeks later, they went and reversed that decision and five of the councillors, including the mayor and deputy mayor, uh, reversed the decision. So what do you think happened there? And also beyond that, sometimes it seems like it takes a long time to get things done, but when the scientists tell us we only have 10 years to avert climate catastrophe, how do you think we can get things done in the timeline that we need to get done? Well, two questions there, and I'll try to answer the first, and if you remind me of the second in a minute. The first question was you asked, and this is a significant issue, you asked what happened when city council reversed itself. If memory serves, it was either a unanimous or close to unanimous vote the night that we had about, I think, 50 young people there, including yourself, and we voted to proceed with on the, on the city manager's recommendation of getting a climate change specialist on board. I think what happened then was the blowback. I did personally did not get too much blowback from that. I think one email, but it, it formed uh, some pretty heated discussion on one of the local radio stations, if memory serves. People said, why the heck are you hiring somebody uh, for 100,000 plus benefits a year? Do we really need this? And so forth. And the feedback so many counselors got uh, triggered a, not a, reversal of the vote. I think what, what we voted instead, or they voted, was to postpone it until Gray County kicks in, uh, kicks in with something down the road. And I thought Richard Thomas was very eloquent when he said, when you're, when you're voting to kick something down the road or waiting on other people to do stuff, you're basically not gonna get it done yourself. And uh, so it became, a, uh, it became a live issue. And I think uh, we heard it from a, gr a great deal of people, apparently, that it was not the way to go, Aiden. So that just underscores the need for political pressure from uh, groups that are perhaps more sensitive to Earth Day and what it represents, that your voices have to be heard loud. I certainly think they were, were heard loud the night you were there, Aiden, but it, it got reversed as my understanding, it got reversed because of a, a radio program and a few other things. Uh, so that answers that. The second issue though, Aiden, I think we have to be realistic. <sighs> If Owen Sound is asked to do something, let's say, let's say magically we do something on a dime, not just hire the specialist, but within a year implement everything the specialist wants. If, if truly we are looking at nine years from then to be a, uh, a catastrophic moment for this earth, I mean, people might vote to do symbolic measures, which is what it would be in Owen Sound, but nobody's going to assume that anything massive can get done because Great Bruce turns on a dime and, and that something nine years down the road can be saved. I'm a little less eloquent with that last answer. Perhaps I wasn't that eloquent with the first one either, uh, but I'm not sure it helps to say that the world is gonna cave in in 10 years. I'm not sure that's an effective way of lobbying politicians based on what I've seen. I hope that's responsive, Aidy. 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, Liz, would you like to add anything about what you thought about that? I think I just wanted to comment on what John said. I think some of what I agree with some of what you said that we need to focus on what we want to get done and not use it as a threat as the motivation. But I think I think we need to talk about what the scientists are telling us, which is that timeline. So I think even though our city is small, I think what we do can do be a role model for other places. And if we change here, they'll start changing in other places as well. So what, Liz, what did you think about that? Well, I'm, I'm sad to hear that a radio show and some comments, you know, and that kind of pushback is going to um, negate the, the science um, and, and the, um, the facts, the data. Um, it's like, it's kind of like saying, um, well, it doesn't matter what we do in Owen Sound, we don't have to self-isolate because we're not very many people. It doesn't matter if we have, you know, a few COVID cases and I don't have to go out. Um, I mean, I can go out and hang out with my friends in the park and, and get, you know, 10 of us all together uh, because it just doesn't matter. I'm sensible. I know what to do. Okay. Uh, I think council is is frankly scared about their re-election. If they're just listening to pushback, they're not listening to the science. And that's what we have to pay attention to. Um, and also, uh, I think I did the math right, um, that the uh, funds, which is already in the budget for the uh, climate change specialist uh, for 2020 is one thousandth of 1% of the city's budget. And yet you can spend 48 million on a wastewater treatment plant that is, I know the city keeps saying, oh, that's the biggest thing we've done for climate change. But according to my research, that is a requirement. You've gone from primary to secondary treatment. And um, Owen Sound was one of the few places with pr primary treatment, which is really not good. So really you've just come up to a standard and it's, that's business as usual. You should be doing that. So if you're, I don't think that's a great, it's a wonderful thing that's happened for the water, but I don't think it's a great claim for climate change. And um, that's it. Liz, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not debating that at all, Liz. I, I would just point out that uh, if, you're dealing, if you're dealing with environmental issues, which the wastewater was, and people say, oh yeah, I've got this envelope of my tax money I'm prepared to spend on the environment. They already, some of them, and this is some of the pushback, uh, that they've done their part for the environment because of the wastewater. By the way, 48 million was the price tag, but obviously that wasn't Owen Sound's portion. Most of it was paid by the other, other levels, but that's a side issue. <laughs> oh, but I keep hearing that that's, we've done this huge thing for climate change and I don't buy that. Yeah, I, I think that's legitimate on your part, Liz. I, I, I'm not. Okay. I'm not going to debate that with you. I was kind okay. of suggesting with our water for so. Many. Oh yeah, I think it was mandated. Uh, you had to do the wastewater thing. All right, I'm yep. going to move on to our third question, and I think um, definitely we're talking about some complex, complex systems. And so I'm, I'm wondering, as we're, as we're addressing what kind of systems that we can change, how can we learn from municipalities and other cities that have done, this, done these changes already? Um, so I wonder if each of you could identify um, one change that you see in a, a municipality in our local area and see how um, either you as a city or together as a municipality, we could work to address um, this one particular, either if it's a if it's a group of people that have come together and are working on this, um, or if it's like composting. Um, I haven't been in this area for a while, so some of my knowledge of what's been changing isn't so great. But yeah, just pick one system um, and see, and and talk about how we could work on that. Um, John, would you like to start? Sure, Lydia, why don't I go first? And unfortunately, I'm, I'm going to do something awful. I'm not going to answer your direct question. I'm going to rephrase it a bit. I think what's most exciting is, is what I see is happening in some of the Western United States. 
And I think, for instance, of Olympia, Washington, where they decided uh, for CO2 and other reasons to just go straight free transit. And it's making a huge difference in ridership. It has gotten cars off the road, a lot of them. And uh, it's, it's been a move in the right direction. Now, during this COVID crisis, you might know we've had free transit as well. And obviously uh, that's no way to measure whether people are traveling more on the bus, um, given the fact there's no place to go. Uh, I'm not, I, so if somebody says, well, free transit has not increased our ridership in Owen Sound during COVID, it's, it certainly isn't a metric that we can really use. But I'm excited about Olympia, Washington, uh, states and cities such as that. And I think free transit might be something we're gonna have to seriously look at. Again, everything comes with a price. That'll be a few hundred thousand dollars a year in lost revenue for the city. What are we gonna do about that? And what are we prepared to ask the taxpayers? So I apologize for going outside of Great Bruce, but that's the one that comes to mind, Lydia. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great idea, John. I, th I think it's something you know that that uh, is worth working forward. Uh, I think the other idea that you already brought up is the green bins. I think that that food waste um, is a huge uh, greenhouse gas emission um, situation. So that's again another cost. But it's um, hoping that the city could look at that as well because many other municipalities in the area are already doing that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Liz. As just as we're briefly talking about a variety of municipalities, I want to um, just recognize that we've got some people here watching from a variety of different places tonight. We have people from Lion's Head, Blue Mountains, Southampton, Owen Sound, and Tobermory. So we're really a, a big community tonight. Aiden, would you ask our last question, and then we're going to move yes. on to bringing some questions from the audience. Yes, I have another question which I'd like to start with John. And I really enjoyed what you said about public transit because we need to start getting less traffic on the streets. That's one of the main problems we have. And also I was really impressed by your idea of a pedestrian street on Second Avenue. That would be incredible. But a lot of people, I think also free public transit would be great. And I hope we can get that implemented. But also I think encouraging people to bike as well and active transit like walking would be great and but a lot of people including my family is afraid to ride on the street and as you know you can't ride on the sidewalk so is there any way that we could solve that problem i know some places do bike lanes that are separated from the road so they have a barrier in between the bike lanes so that people feel safe from the cars or what other things would you think we could do to solve the congestion and uh, traffic. Well, here's one thing Owen Sound could do and buy a free return air ticket to Holland, uh, of which I'm very fond, and see how you live with the congested country where you have segregated bike lanes. You pass between beautiful oak trees that have been there for a century, well protected from the cars, and there's cows on one side, oak trees on the other, and there's your traffic. It's a beautiful system. And I think we need to be more imaginative. I don't think anything ticked me off more in terms of recent highway construction than when we built the road to Sable Beach without, without a bike lane. I, I, you know, I mean, come on. I mean, this is, uh, as, as our prime minister said, this is uh, 20 something and we're not building bike lanes. It just has to be a given that you're gonna build bike lanes. And uh, I wish our county and provincial people had done a better job on those sorts of things. And uh, I certainly, I, I have three bikes myself. Uh, I'm not the fastest guy out there, but I love my bikes. And yeah, I'd like to see Owen Sound do that. Now, here's what I'm gonna promise you. I, I'm lucky enough to have been appointed to the operations committee of Owen Sound. And uh, I certainly want to look into the costing of additional bike trails in the city. I'm not up to speed on that, but I think it's an interesting topic. Perhaps for the more sparse, sparsely populated areas of, of the region, it's not as important, but, uh, but I think certainly in our cities and towns, we should, we should be looking at that. Again, it comes with a price. But it's interesting when you visit when you visit Sweden, when you visit Holland, when you visit Belgium, 
they just sort of understand that to have a beautiful landscape doesn't just happen. And uh, it takes an investment and they're just more willing to do it there. Bit of a long answer, Aiden, but uh, I'm all in favor of what you just suggested. Yeah, thank you. I think some of those ideas are great. I think having a strong division between the cars and the bicycles is essential for people to feel safe. Because also another idea could be lowering the speed limit as well. So, but Liz, would you like to add anything about that? I, no, I think John's been really eloquent. <laughs> Don't really have anything to add. Great idea. Yeah, thank you. Well, now we're going to actually open the questions to our audience. So again, if you're just joining now, you can ask any question you want at the bottom of your screen, which is the chat function. Or if you're watching on a tablet or phone, you can click more and then click chat to be able to do that. Also, if you're out there watching on YouTube or Facebook, I know I can't see any of you, but I know you're eager to find out more. You can ask questions in the comments and we'll try and get to those as well. Lydia, would you like to ask the first question? Yeah, absolutely. And I want to say thank you so much to all of the questions so far. They are fantastic. And I am so sorry we're not going to get to all of them, but we will we will pick a few out and hold on to your questions. And you can send them to Kat to uh, Climate Action Team or join the visioning session tomorrow. And we'll talk about that a bit later. Um, my first question from the audience is again about lo about locality, actually. Somebody is wondering about um, food security for local families. So in this time, <clears throat> certainly um, food security is more of an issue, especially for low income families. And certainly this pertains to climate change as well. We need, we need systems that are resilient to um, distance and resilient to the changes in weather. So yeah, um, could you speak to food security in our community? Liz, do you mind starting with that? I, I haven't given that one a lot of thought. Yeah, I, I'm um, not an expert on that either. Um, but I know we have Thorsten Arnold in, in the audience, who's a farmer, a regenerative agri agriculturalist, and is giving a series of talks and, and about, uh, well, how, how we maintain our farms and our soil so that we actually can grow locally which is really important. And that's one of my slides, which you'll get to. Um, Thorsten has a, a depth of knowledge. I, I really don't. Uh, he's also one of the founders of Eat Local um, with the local farmers. So I think the Poverty Task Force is one group that's working on that, probably the United Way. I really don't know what the answer is in terms of food security. Uh, a, a universal basic income would be a help so that people have enough income to, to buy the food that they need. I, I think it has to be on a systemic level that um, people are, 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 you know, have the ability to, to feed themselves. That's this just basic, it's so important. Absolutely. I'm gonna add one more thing, actually, this might make a little more sense in the context of the city. Um, People were also asking in the chat how um, the ecological crisis and increasing floods and different things, these are going to hit people of lower incomes a little bit or quite a bit more. Um, so in terms of uh, those things, when they start hitting the cities um, and our communities, there, there will need to be a response from the municipality as well. And this is kind of thinking generally, thinking in the future. Um, the city that I was in, at school in, we have definitely been hit by the floods. And so that's a very tangible response um, that we can see. But do you have any thoughts, John, about how we can support people of lower incomes as we head into the new crisis? Looks like we've got some frozen video going on. Oh, here he comes. <laughs> here we go. Lydia, can you hear me? Yes, you're good now. First of all, one thing about climate change, I'm not disagreeing with the premise of your question. I, I challenge it slightly. I think it is going to hit the wealthy. I think it already is. If you look at the uh, homeowners along Lake Erie, if you even look along Balmy Beach locally, uh, these high waters are going to start crushing uh, a lot of wealthy uh, properties uh, or uh, 
properties that are owned by wealthy people and so forth. I, I think it's going to hit uh, perhaps the poor disproportionately, but nobody's escaping this and uh, it is becoming an environmental catastrophe. If you Google uh, Michigan uh, shoreline collapse uh, or Lake Erie shoreline collapse, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Um, so I do think it's going to hit the wealthy as well as the poor. In terms of, can you give examples of how it would disproportionately hit the poor, Lydia? Because I'd like to answer your question more specifically. Can you give me a, an example? Yes, um, I think I think it's a little bit more difficult in Owen Sound situation, perhaps, uh, because we haven't had super <laughs> huge floods or different things like this. But I think food security is a great example as per the per the first question. So a lot of people cannot get local food because sometimes it's a little bit more expensive. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, I'm just trying. Oh, can I just add something that I'm seeing in the chat that uh, that um, the Climate Action Team's new website has a section on food security groups you can volunteer with or support with donations. So you just have to go to graybruceclimateaction.ca slash groups. And, and I think that the more well off of us, you know, middle class um, types, retired, got some extra funds, we can all help donate as well. I mean, if you can't volunteer and do something, you can still give money and that can help as well. You know, it's interesting. I, I do have a lot of interest in supply management, and I've been a critical, um, I've been a bit of a critic of supply management. I happen to know a lot of uh, dairy farmers, just given my cultural background. Um, and I question, they were spilling a lot of milk lately, and I question sometimes supply management in terms of its role with food security, the way it drives up the prices for the poor. I think we pay about 30% more for milk, cheese, and butter in, in Ontario, just roughly, than they do in Michigan or upstate New York, and chickens as well. It seems to me the poultry uh, cartel, because that's what it is, uh, really hinders the ability of people to sell and purchase fairly cheap eggs. Uh, I'm not, I think it's a We can't hear you, so I. Yeah, he's, he's frozen. John, you're frozen. Yeah, just wait a minute. We it's just a little bit technical difficulty, and I think it will sort itself out. Just did did you hear what okay. I was saying about supply management? Uh, most okay. of it. Just, I'm sorry. Just, just the last, just the last maybe half a minute. I'm just saying that if people can't sell chicken eggs without breaching the rules of some cartel, I think that's regrettable. And I think the poor are hindered by that. I think when we talk about food security, we really have to think long and hard about supply management. It does allow small herds of cows, I get that. Um, but on another level, it's made a lot of people very wealthy and it, it's made the poor have to pay quite a bit more for some of their product. It's an issue, it's a complex issue, but I think it's worthy of talking, of discussion. Thanks for that, John. Aiden, All right. if you have a question from Facebook, Aiden? Yeah, actually, well, I have one from YouTube and they were asking about what are the alternatives, and this is probably mainly for John, what are the alternatives for a green bin pickup? And they were saying how many people are there that could do composting in their backyard? And I might just want to add like, for instance, maybe we could also add drop-off sites where people could drop their compost off at grocery stores, yeah or things like that, but what would your answer be to that question? Well, for drop-off, I, I suppose, I, I don't know what world will have the own sound. It's always open. You can, be, you can go there and throw whatever you want. It's my understanding, so long as it's green. I may be wrong on that. Don't go there if I'm wrong. I'll have to research that. But uh, in terms of other options, keeping it in your backyard, my understanding is that's discouraged by most cities and towns. Uh, for past reasons, and a lot of people just don't want to do it for that reason. Uh, that's why the green bin system was developed, is because people did not want this in their backyard, which may work if you own an acreage or two, but uh, it's less likely to work in the city. 
And I know that's that was the impetus for some of the program there. But on the other hand, it'd be an interesting question at election time if, if it's a choice between paying, and again, my numbers are only rough. Last time I looked at it, I think about 300 to 400,000 for the green bins. Uh, if the option between that or doing in your backyard, what do you want to do? I think it's an interesting discussion to have. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And just a follow up, do you think that the city could implement like as a transition, just allowing a few drop off sites? And I know that there's a composting uh, location at the edge of town. They could maybe have some drop off sites and then take it on trucks and load it over there. Do you think that would be something that would work? Well, as I said, I'm on the operations committee, and if somebody wants to email me that as well, I am taking notes, but I'll certainly bring that up because it's something that's never been raised to my knowledge before, and I think it's absolutely something basic. Uh, you're asking a citizen to do the citizen's duty, and it might not cost that much money. I think it's a great suggestion. Let me look into that. Okay, thank you. Is there anything you'd like to add, Liz, or should we go to the next one? Um. No, I just saw in the, in the chat that Verma composting is good for homes with no outdoor access. Okay, well, that's a good idea. Yeah, I saw that as well. Thank you for that. All right. I'm gonna, okay, I'm gonna ask one more question and we'll have maybe two more questions. We're gonna wrap up at 8.30 and don't forget we've got a poet laureate coming up to finish off our night. So hold, hold in for that. Um, again. Absolutely so much for coming and I want to remind you if you would please put your email and your address and where you're from into the chat then we can keep in touch after this this panel as well we've got some great resources that we'll send to you tomorrow so my next question I'd like to ask to Liz um so you talked about communication kind of in your in your intro and I really got struck by that. We have some questions in our chat about communication as well. So they're wondering about how we can use social media to address both the pandemic crisis um, and stay connected as well as how we can use that in the ecological crisis. And I'm gonna add one more piece to this because this is a, a separate question that COVID is really bringing to light that people in rural communities are having trouble with internet. And so there's, there's that kind of divide as well. And so again, the lower income people are a little bit, or not necessarily low income in town, we also have issues um, and different barriers and things like that. Um, but yeah, I wonder if you could speak to communication and in various forms. Right, okay, thanks, Lydia. Um, I've thought a lot about communication. I'm, you know, I'm working with the communication group of the climate action team. I think social media, you know, young people use social media differently. We've certainly learned that um, than us older folk do. So uh, sometimes there's separate platforms and not everybody's seeing everything. I, I'm constantly posting, posting, posting on Facebook, but that's really the only platform I use. So I think, um, I think it's a good use, but it doesn't reach everybody. And, and like you say, the issue of um, the internet speeds, which is a really big issue for our rural areas, especially. And um, if, if I may, I'd like to broaden out kind of communication to include communication between the public and um, the municipalities. Because uh, I guess for the last, um, Oh, 10 years or so, I've been going to Owen Sound City Council meetings, um, committee meetings, strategic planning sessions. And so I, I, I have seen uh, a lot of, about how things operate. And I even made some notes about this one because it came up in our tech chat. <laughs> so um, I think what's really important for us to all be working together is that the city has to communicate better to us. And um, you know, the 10th Street Bridge construction, um, we're, we're really kept up to date. There was an article in the Sun-Times today, uh, the director of public works does these really wonderful, informative, and even funny videos. Um, and so we're really kept up to date on infrastructure things, but I haven't hardly seen anything on climate change. And, and granted we're in COVID now and that's understandable. 
and the mayor is taking an active role with COVID. But I think over the long term, we really need the city to step up, educate us, um, keep us surprised of what you're doing. Even when uh, I was at council, when someone asked, I think it was a uh, deputy mayor, uh, Brian O'Leary said, I don't even know what the city's doing about climate change. And I was shocked. <laughs> so um, let's get that message out. We need more meaningful engagement. Um, right now, the city's 20-year uh, official plan is in progress. And, um, and I know there's a set way that municipalities tend to do engagement, but it's really got to be uh, improved. Uh, there's a survey. Um, you get to tick three boxes. I mean, that's not meaningful. Um, even though you can say, okay, well, a thousand people ticked three boxes, but I don't know what kind of data you're getting from that. And the city held a visioning session and um, I went to that. And in a city of 20 some thousand people, there were 15 people there and 12 of them were from the climate action team group. So somehow you're not reaching us. Um, so I just think that can be improved. And then real collaboration. Um, that's consultation on a very kind of window dressing level. And our climate action team did propose um, a citizen city staff task force. And from what I understand, the city turned that down because you didn't have the staff capacity to deal with it. Again, we're coming back to staff capacity to communicate, to educate, and to work with us. And, and so that's, I think, something that could be considered and improved. Ollie, I would like to ask one more question to John. And this one is from YouTube. So thank you to all the people who are out there watching on YouTube and at Facebook as well. You can keep... Uh, uh, we'll try to answer as many questions, but I think we just can do one more for tonight. But we might send out answers to people through the email for, to give you some more information. So my question for John is from YouTube, is the city able to tighten bylaws for new buildings to meet passive house standards, mandate use of ground and air source heating and cooling, and additionally protect green space and biodiversity? John, what do you think yeah, about that? Yeah, we, we don't have as much leverage or influence as people think when it comes to passing bylaws like that. A lot of what you're doing would infringe upon the building code of Ontario. And uh, I don't like politicians who always say it's some other level of government that has to work on it. But one of the, um, I think for bang for the dollar, if you want to lobby Ontario for anything, why don't we lobby them for changes to the building code? and mandate that every new building either has to have wind, passive, something massive that will cut its electric, electricity bill, its, its CO2 emissions and so forth. If you can imagine every house, uh, every build in Ontario having to meet some new standards like that, it would make things more expensive. I, I know that, but uh, it, it certainly would help a lot. So to answer your question, uh, you don't have the power in bylaws to pass most of what I just heard in that question. It would have to be uh, amendments to the Ontario Building Code, which I would invite. Yes. And I think that was a great way to reduce uh, our emissions. I've, I've read some books that just by weatherproofing our buildings, we can save probably up to 30% of the emissions. So that's a great way. Liz, would you like to add anything? Or? Should we go on? Uh, well, I think that's a great idea. I think the um, every, although I, I'm not quite sure what the city's allowed to do in terms of the municipal act and everything, but but why not in terms of new development, um, you know, have requirements for developers that have to do that type of thing that you're talking about, John. Um, so that, because the city has its own bylaws, I believe in that area. So instead of again, waiting for the province to do something, um, figure out what you can do at a local level. Understood. Can I ask one last question before we move on to our last bit? 
Fire away, Lydia. All right. I, well, I think this is hopefully a yeah. fun question. Um, what have you been doing? That what has been the most fun thing that you've been doing with the more more time that you've had lately? Oh, working with you guys. <laughs> Yeah, and, and and reading stories. I, I brought my mother up from Grimsby. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Sorry, Liz, finish up. No, I'm just gonna say reading bedtime stories to my granddaughter over Zoom. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. All right, Aiden. All right. Yeah, I would just like to ask one more question to Liz. It's just, I just wanted to ask if you have a few things. This is not from the audience, but. Are there any questions, any things that we can do in our own life? Is there any changes that we could just do today or tomorrow that would decrease our impact on the environment? Well, just, I, just, I like a, just like five things or three things we could do. So, well, I know one big thing is reduce your, your consumption of meat and dairy. Um, yes. I would say take that 52-week, um, climate action challenge because there are going to be some amazing um, suggestions and then you know it just comes at you a little bit and then uh, the third thing I would say is go to the resilience film website and click on uh, what can I do and I'll try right. to put it in the chat because we've already prepared a whole list of at the individual um, community and municipal level of actions so do a little research. And the other thing I forgot to say about communication was just, um, it's not all on the city. I don't mean to keep saying that over and over. It's everybody, we all have to speak up. We have to talk with our politicians. John is, is great. He's really open. He's, he's prepared to debate. I love debating and talking with John. Um, we, you know, we go have beers, you know, engage email, phone. Um, come to meetings. You know, this is not just the city's job. It's a two-way thing. Absolutely. We can all play a pet in the, the, in the change that must be created by all of us. So I, I have questions period is over for today. So Aiden. And now we'd Aiden, like to. Aiden. Yes. Can I, can I, 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 I don't think I got a chance to answer either though. So real quick. Okay. I, I was yeah, just going to sure. say, in response to Lydia's question, I brought my mom up from Grimsby, and she had four lovely weeks uh, enjoying our area in Georgian Bay. So it's been a time to slow down and get to know my mom again. So there's a shout out for mom. As far as uh, what you can do uh, in a practical sense, I don't think I'll get in any trouble from Liz for saying this. You can read poetry. And you can read Wendell Berry, and you can read some of the great essays that have been written by some of the great conservationist thinkers. And they are on the right wing of politics and the left wing. That's the beautiful thing about this. It has a perception that it's partisan, it's not. Some of the greatest conservationist movements on earth have begun with uh, uh, Republicans, for instance, Republican presidents ages ago in the, in the States. So read widely, read variously, and read poetry, and grow to love that which you see from your front porch. Sorry to repeat myself. Sorry, Aiden, I had to jump in and say that. <laughs> oh, thank you. I think the more we become aware about the problem, the more we can know how we can solve it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we'd like to thank a great panelist for tonight. I think John provides some really incredible insights about ideas like free transit and other things. I would like to first, let's say goodbye to John. Thank you for joining us. Bye, Great John. Being here. John. Great being here. And then Liz, yeah. thank you also. I think you, you told us many things that we could do and all about all the great groups we have in Great Bruce, the Climate Action Team, the resilience film and the website we can go to. I think because of this, I think people feel more empowered to take action and feel that their voice matters. So thank you, Liz. Bye, Liz. Thanks, you See too. Liz. Bye. See you, Liz. <laughs> yep. Bye, John. All right. So now let's we're gonna do a little conclusion and summarize what we talked about tonight. 
I think we had a great discussion tonight. Lydia, what did you think about the discussion? Yeah, I think it was fantastic to hear perspectives from both a local level and a government level. And I definitely heard some themes coming through and I'm just gonna mention a few of them. Um, I love that the idea that, um, I, know, I don't love this, but it's just a fact that climate change and COVID are very similar in the way that they're touching at our social, economic and environmental systems. And we need to find solutions that can address all of those different sectors. So that was, that was a pretty huge one that came out. Another one is that education is important and communication is important. And it sounds like because these issues are so complicated, we really do need to educate each other in the city, um, whether we're passing each other six feet apart and sharing stories about how to cook a local dish, um, or if we're sharing, sharing success stories between municipalities like John was talking about, or sharing um, education from the municipality to its citizens as well. So those are kind of some big themes that I saw. What themes did st stand out for you, Aiden? So, oh, thank you, Lydia. I agree that the COVID-19 crisis and the coronavirus similarity was one of the greatest themes, I think, because it shows the weakness of uh, economic systems and how both of them are disproportionately affecting low income and minorities, like you said, and many other people said that tonight. I also wanted to just repeat some of the ideas we heard tonight. We heard ideas about free transit. I think that's a way that we need to go forward in because sometimes they say that the bus doesn't get used as much as it should, but if we don't give people a chance and encourage them to use it, then we can't really know if it's gonna work. So I think making it free would be a great way to go forward. Also separating bike lanes from the roads maybe doing one-way streets so that we could allow more room for cycling. And then also talking about how we can get things done and, and getting people on board and not worrying about how we pay for it. Because I think many of these questions, some of them are expensive, but some of them we can do just by collective action and pressuring a government to do things. So I think that was a theme tonight that when we stand together, we can create real change. I agree. We will keep connected. So please put your email in the chat. One more, one last reminder, and we'll be sending out more information tomorrow. Yes. And I would like to, before we end off, I would like to also announce an event that's going to be happening this Friday. It's called Flies for Future 24, and it's a 24-hour online climate strike which was happening in place of a global climate strike, which is supposed to happen this Friday. So all different countries around the world are participating. You can watch that outline and we'll send out the link for that as well. It's put on by Flies to Future International and we'll be posting it on our social media as well. So it'll, it'll feature musicians, activists, scientists, please stay tuned for that event. We, yeah, I, I think I, we have an event to share as well. Would you like to do that? Yeah, thank you. I'm going to announce just in one other event. It's actually happening tomorrow. The uh, climate action team will be having a visioning session and that is open to anyone. It will be tomorrow night at 7 p.m. And I will be putting a Zoom link in the chat very, very soon. And so yeah, check that out. You can look them up on Facebook as well, but you can also just go directly to the session tomorrow night. All it right, thank you. Off. So I think we're going to say good night to everyone. But before we go, we're going to introduce our last uh, feature for tonight, which is the poet laureate from Owen Sound, our own poet laureate from who has a two year term. And he's focusing this term on environmental concerns and ecology. I'm really in impressed by what he's done. He's already performed it a few climate strikes. And he has a new premiere, a world premiere of a poem that's never been performed before, which he's going to perform for us tonight. I wanna to thank Richard for 
asking to be a part of this when it, when he told me that he wanted to be a part of this i thought it was incredible because i think it should always be part of the revolution whether we're talking about climate change social justice i think we need to include art and music and poetry so thank you to richard and let's introduce richard he's going to end the evening and after that although we just started the conversation. We want you to keep talking about this. Let's welcome Richard. Hello, Richard. Oh, hi. Hi, all. Well, Aiden and Lydia, John and Liz, thanks for having me here. I'm honored to be able to provide a modest contribution to what has been such an information-packed evening. Uh, and to amplify what John said uh, about Wendell Berry, I'd also recommend W.S. Merwin, uh, not only because as Poet Laureate of the United States a few years back, he had a very strong ecological focus to his work, but also because I married into his family. So uh, I'm actually related by marriage to him. So it's a little bit of a plug there for somebody who really doesn't need a plug because he's won so many awards. But anyway. If art has one thing to say to us at this time of crisis, it's that we're all in this together. All of the world's problems are intersectional. And we need to rely on one another, I think kind of goes without saying. Tonight has been an excellent example of community interaction and motivation. So kudos to the people who put this on and to everybody involved with this and all the participants and, and, the, uh, and, the, and the people who you know, who took some time out of a, of a midweek evening to, uh, to attend this tonight. So got a little poem for you called Tripping Up the Stairs. Yes. And just before we, we're going to say goodbye, just before you start, and then we're going to give you the whole screen. So Lydia, would you like to say goodnight to everyone? Yeah, I just want to say thank you again to everyone who was watching and put their questions in. You had really great insights. So please Keep talking about those and come to the visioning session for Climate Action Team tomorrow night. Thank you and good night. All right, goodbye, Lydia. And then I'll just say good night to everyone. Thank you all for tuning in. And if you provide your email address, we'll follow up with some more information and how you can get involved if you want to continue speaking up and taking action on climate change. Th Richard, thanks for being here. You're going to end the night, and afterward, we can start talking about what we heard tonight. Take it away, Richard. All right, thanks, Aiden. So tripping up the Goodbye. stairs. It's always some degrees cooler in a forest. And if you break that code, you'll know what trees are trying to tell deaf buildings in which we button up French cuffs and hold caution to our chests tightly, preferring the writing desk to the raven, trying not to trip as we climb the stairs to reach the incandescent bulbs of stars in our all-night vigil over roadkill. And if you learn what the trees are saying, it's nothing to do with sewing machines, coffee pots, or indoor plumbing. Their words don't escape in a torrent of umbrellas and ironing boards, but in things babies know to be true and consider important enough to inscribe on stalks of Timothy to be read at vol eye level by those prepared to get down on the carpet and kick the habit of diesel fumes and hold something soft in their mouths instead, like orchid nectar or moss, or an admission of love. All right, thanks all.